Uh, thank you, Shabayou. If you could uh, stay online, we're going to have a panel discussion now, so we'll have questions from the audience. Sure. And would uh, questioners please come up to one of the microphones so that we can record the questions. I'm Michael Leff. I'm with the Davy Institute in the Forest Service. And my question, I guess, is for Stuart Gaffin. I wonder about, uh, with urban heat island, you know, it seems like the temperature difference is relatively small compared to what I experience. And so it seems to me that, that those kind of measurements are addressing conduction and convection. But what about radiant energy, ra radiant heat, where you're not, you know, when you're shaded and the sun's not hitting you? So, like, regardless of the temperature and the air surrounding me, it feels a whole lot different. Is there a way of measuring that? Well, sure. You can do the, uh, it's a very interesting subject, the energy balance of the human body, <laughs> the surface energy balance. There's a whole chapter in, a, in the classic book by Tim Oak on energy balance of animals. Um, it's the same principles we use. And, and it, you know, the thermal comfort, it's a very interesting point because I find... Um, I tell people not to try to intuit what's causing them to feel warm or not, not, not to try to intuit the air temperature based on how you're feeling. Um, so those things can be quantified and they're all part of uh, thermal comfort. You're going to feel radiant energy from a hot pavement. You're going to feel solar energy <clears throat> from the sun. That's all going to be contributing to, to the differences you feel when you move from a sunny location to under a tree. And a lot of what you feel when you move from a, a, a sun exposure to under a tree is the absence of that solar radiation. Uh, and in long wind ra radiation from the ground. So it, it's a very, uh, that's why we need those sensors. Um, now, as far as those temperatures not being dramatic, um, I don't know if I f agree. I mean, um, for example, Diane showed uh, the sensitivity of, um, I think it was energy usage, energy usage to uh, air temperature. And it, it's, it's, you know, every degree makes a tremendous difference, especially when you're, you're at, you know, peak loads, uh, like we were getting to every summer. We're just, you know, that, that far off busting the grid. Um, so every degree can mean a lot when it comes to that, and, and, and also to building energy um, usage as well. You know, in climate speak, like I say, we're talking about three degrees Celsius uh, for the mid-range mid warming. So if we can shave off one or two degrees of that, that's a, a major offset. So. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question. I have a question for all of the panelists. Um, Stuart, you were talking about comparative studies. Uh, you were working on a street by street level. I'm interested in one level higher, perhaps. Let's call it neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, one of the challenges whenever we're working with tree research is how long it takes to grow large, mature trees. Um, it's interesting when you look at the opposite phenomenon, which is that we have examples where we lose them very quickly. Uh, what I'm thinking of are uh, wind storms. So in the Midwest, we're looking at tornadoes and straight line winds. Uh, but then we also have uh, things like emerald ash borer and other examples where we're losing entire neighborhoods of trees. But the interesting result is we end up with a neighborhood denuded of mature trees immediately adjacent to a neighborhood with substantial tree canopy cover, large mature trees. In the water world, we do uh, paired hydrolo hydrology studies neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, what I'm wondering is if we can identify paired neighborhoods like this, uh, what, how can those opportunities be used in each one of your fields? Make a nice study. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a real opportunity. We did a small, just leave it. We did a small study uh, comparing six houses landscape largely with, with native plants versus six traditional landscapes. And we, we found significant effects in, in caterpillar load and, and breeding bird diversity. Um, and that's, that's a very small comparison. And we controlled for, for the amount of plant biomass. So the only difference was, was a percentage of, of native plants there. So that you're talking about a larger study, and that would be, that would be great. Um, I think the, the, the answer is going to be obvious, but at least we could put numbers on it and, and, and uh, show how big the difference is. So yeah, it's a good idea. My only 
quick comment is I think it would take a long period of observation um, to see the effects. I mean, uh, I've sometimes wondered, hey, can I, after a snowfall, can I show if the city's albedo went up, did it do something to the Teat Island effect? And I'm pretty sure it, a short, short-lived event like that wouldn't be enough and you need a lot of observation. So I, I'm suspecting with your experiment, um, it would require a, a fairly long-term planning to you know, campaign to monitor. That, that actually would be an advantage from, from my perspective in that we can, we can measure biodiversity pretty quickly. One, one summer, several hits throughout the summer would give you a good data set. So. Um, some of our studies that have looked at um, upstream, downstream consequences of uh, vegetation, primarily trees, would look at, for example, upstream, downstream of just a, a, a road culvert in that short amount of space or say, for example, through the campus of the University of New Hampshire, you can, uh, I showed a correlogram in my uh, presentation on uh, memory and stream temperature and you, you see that signal in just short gaps in the stream. And these are, you know, small streams. So it doesn't take much of a loss of canopy for you to start to see uh, real time signals. I have a question. Gary Allen, obviously, I've introduced myself already. It's for Doug primarily, but several of the rest of you might want to comment on it. Very few urban areas and even fewer, probably suburban areas and even fewer urban areas, actually are trying to manage for enhanced bear population. But if you stop to think about it, uh, many of them like access to nature. Are there any existing studies that show a correlation between biodiversity and its enhancement and human health and quality of life in uh, the urban and suburban environments. So how many birds are enough to really give people a sense of value to their community? That's really what I'm right. trying to drive yeah. it toward. I, I'm not up on that literature, but there, there's work out of Chicago that has shown, it, even if it's not the bird, is, does anybody else know more about this? I know that you know walking through the woods, we just saw some of, some of those data have health benefits. When there's, when there's a wider variety of species there. Yeah. Well, I want to challenge some of you who are really interested in seeing urban tree enhancement and protection and expansion in urban forestry. Doug's work hits so vitally on how that ought to be looked at in terms of the evolved population of native species in an area, but ultimately helping the public appreciate that value and uh, celebrate it and show that it, how it benefits them, it seems to me that's an area where we haven't done as good a job as an investigation and that more studies may be called for. So Doug, your help there would be really, really uh, helpful to I think the whole, whole area. <laughs> You know, Richard Louvre points out that our kids are the future stewards of the planet, and right now they have no appreciation of nature because they're just plugged into something. Uh, so building these, these uh, communities right in your own backyard, your front yard, is a great way to reconnect your kids with their connection to the rest of the planet. I mean, that's a very strong argument, and it's, and it's easily done. Can I, can I just say, uh, Gary, uh, we conducted three surveys and we're running a series of focus groups down in Tampa right now. And on all of those surveys and in the focus group, the number one reason why people want the urban forest is for wildlife habitat. So whether there's, whether there's any good studies about whether it makes you feel better, you're healthier or whatever, uh, the people where I come from are saying that it's the number one reason. But that, that and that reminds me of some statistics. You know, there's 79 million bird watchers in this country. Many of them just put, just feeding the birds in their backyard. That's a lot of people. It's actually a huge industry, billions and billions of dollars. So that shows there's interest. There's a connection. Okay. My... Shubayu, Shubayu uh, feel free to answer a question if you'd like. That previous question uh, seems relevant to you. So did you have any response to that? Um, yes, I do. I mean, I, I don't know if uh, you can actually consider, um, you know, urban vegetable gardens and urban farms as part of biodiversity, um, you know, I, I don't see a reason why you cannot. And uh, 
and so those neighborhoods definitely benefit a lot, and there's certainly um, you know significant health benefits. I'm not aware of any study which looks at it, but I would imagine there would be significant health benefits in terms of you know giving uh, uh, local people access to healthy foods, for example. So 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 you know th that that's one example where there could be a direct um, impact of uh, biodiversity on, on on healthy eating. Okay. Uh, I'm Jay Townsend at the University of Delaware, and I have a question for Shabaya. <clears throat> uh, in terms of the health benefits of uh, the urban forest and tree canopy, you mentioned um, hypertension, uh, you mentioned depression, but in the tradition of um, Roger Ulrich at the University of Delaware, um, I would say that there's a, an aspect of uh, reduced um, mental stress. and. Uh, it's very hard to measure mental stress. Um, it's something that um, all of us seem to be aware of. But there's another field that's really taken and run with the, the message that, that horticulture reduces stress, and that's hort therapy. Um, hort therapy is a, a strong and thriving area, and we don't seem to be addressing uh, you know, that function at all in our discussion of the services of the urban forest. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in mental health, but um, you know, there are probably ways of you know structured interviews that might actually uh, you know give one a way to quantify what these impacts are. There's there's definitely very um, established protocols to to figure out quality of life related questions, for example, health related quality of life, uh, and, and 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 so there are probably some psychometric ways of estimating reductions in stress because of uh, having easier access to, to urban forests. Um, it, it's, you know, mental, issue, mental health in general is an understudied area. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, it, it's more understudied with less relevant context of uh, urban forestry. That's it. Thank you. Hi. Is this working? Sorry. Uh, my name is Kara Reeve, and I'm with National Wildlife Federation, and I manage our Climate Smart Communities program, um, which is focused on helping communities uh, be prepared for the impacts of climate change by utilizing natural systems like urban forests. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about the multiple benefits that urban um, forests, urban trees provide, and you know, stormwater benefit, biodiversity value, et cetera. But we know all trees aren't created equal in a regional context, particularly since we know that climate change is shifting the range of tree species. And I'm wondering if the panelists have thought about, one, about kind of integrating your work across um, benefits, let's say. So looking at not just um, which trees can support, support the most wildlife, but which trees can support, support the most wildlife in urban environments, given the way that you know, ranges are shifting and things like that, and trying to pull together all these different um, factors. And I'm wondering if the panel has thought about that or if they're familiar with others that are doing that kind of work, because I'm very interested in that. I, I can pretty well guarantee that's a wide open area that um, nobody has, has looked at that. So if you can find a funding source. Well, we have <laughs> talked about it, Doug, but yeah. I was wondering <laughs> from a stormwater perspective or heat island or, you know. Um, I think you're just looking primarily at um, multi-benefit uh, possibilities uh, from the stormwater vantage point. Um, many of these systems are put in uh, installation by installation, tree by tree. Um, this certainly requires a much larger effort at looking at ultimately what you're, you're going to do on, on, a, on a larger scale. But when you're selecting a tree for one simple system, um, a lot of that thought process isn't involved in it. A lot of the times you're just trying to get that system in. Uh, doesn't mean that what you're talking about isn't important. It's incredibly important. But that's where you need something, a layer of oversight that's usually much higher above than the individual site level. Yeah, and I was just, that's kind of what I'm getting at. If there was a way we could think of some kind of ranking factors and criteria to help guide um, communities that might have different priorities, you know, at the community scale, not just the site level, but stormwater management is really important, but also biodiversity, you know, and help them manage that. But anyway. My name is Kathy Wolf, and I'm a social scientist I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, 
not so much a question, more of a comment. And that is, uh, we've heard a little bit about public health, about some of the meta uh, studies that have been done, looking at um, other studies done of late. And um, I'm hoping that we can perhaps elevate public health to uh, be considered another set of ecosystem services, the cultural ecosystem services. As diagrammed in the handouts for this event, uh, public health is seen as an outcome, and it's this big bundle of stuff that happens if we take care of the environment. And um, in the classifications of ecosystem services, uh, cultural ecosystem services, health um, is actually another set of ecosystem services. And uh, so ongoing study is, is valuable. As we've heard, there's some uncertainty about some of the findings of the past, though uh, for instance, the parks work, uh, early studies looked at parks just as an element on the ground, and now some of the more recent work is discovering that the features within the park can indeed have an effect on people's physical activity, including trees and water, not surprisingly. So uh, I just uh, hope that we can keep public health uh, in a place where it does uh, remain and become a, a, a more uh, a key part of the ecosystem services research agenda because it is uh, maybe the thing that people in our communities will most connect with in terms of support of urban forestry programs. While our uh, decision makers in our communities must acknowledge the regulatory infrastructure and expectations to engage people in stewardship and to be a part of all of this, uh, those cultural ecosystem services might play out very, very well. Any other questions? Yes. I wanted to make a brief comment on the, the question just before this. Um, my name's Randy Nieprash. I'm a civil engineer from Minnesota. Uh, I've enjoyed the comments about engineers both ways, really. Um, I come from the stormwater side of things. I also come from the side of regulated communities. Um, one of the interesting barriers when it comes to multidisciplinary work that looks at the multiple benefits of urban trees is we have a situation, I'd be real curious to, to hear the comments from the EPA folks on this. It's my understanding that we have situations where regulatory agencies are statutorily prohibited from looking at benefits from outside of the purview of their regulatory universe. So for instance, in the context of developing stormwater regs, uh, say cost-benefit analysis and such, uh, EPA may not be able to include uh, costs and benefits uh, for the all the other uh, benefits from urban trees. Uh, that could be a factor, but it's a statutory limitation. That's an, an interesting barrier and one worth noting. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Greenstone from the Agricultural Research Service, and uh, it looks like we'll be moving away from biodiversity issues, so I wanted to make a point about biodiversity and trees. Trees are the focus of the, the title, sort of the organizing principle, but we've also seen landscapes that have other things than trees in them. And I think we need to remember that trees live in much more diverse ecosystems in, in urban areas. And not only do those um, systems, those plant systems, increase the biodiversity of the animals inhabiting them, but also the trees themselves. In fact, every element is dependent upon the, uh, the other elements. So, for example, in biocontrol, which I work on, uh, the parasitic and predatory uh, arthropods that are attacking your insect pest may be visiting um, weeds, for example, flowering weeds in the turf to, uh, uh, to collect nectar, to collect pollen, and so on, things that they absolutely have to have in order for them to provide the ecosystem services that uh, we need. So um, I hope we'll continue to think about the other elements uh, of the landscape. And also, um, we've noted that, you know, um, despite the remarks of a certain California governor when I was 
well, more than knee high to a grasshopper. It's not that you've seen one tree, you've seen them all. They all do differ. Uh, <laughs> turf grasses differ. And when we see that there's a problem, you know, for example, with, with pollen or with turf um, becoming a source, not a sink of, of methane, we should see what we can do to uh, improve those elements too, you know, and, and I'm not the first one to say that here. But I think we just we need to remember that there are all these elements involved in the urban forest. Thanks. Just to respond to that, uh, to, to expand on that, Matt, our trees in our urban areas, we complain about them dying young. Well, they're surrounded by cement. You know, if they're surrounded by, some, or, or, or lawn, where they're mowed and compacted soil. We treat our trees terribly, but we could increase their lifespan if we treated them like trees and gave them the entire ecosystem like Matt's suggesting. So that's another thing we might want to think about. Um, we, we don't want to make wild and messy places, but uh, trees will live longer. Uh, time. Uh, hi. Uh, Ian Hanau, based in Denver, private consultant. Um, I was just whispering this to Monica sitting next to me, and I think Kathy Wolf in particular and others will be really interested. I had dinner with my family. I grew up in this area on Sunday night, and um, my in-laws, one of their daughters, was doing an inventory in a park, and she started telling me about this. And the driver, I'm going to the website so I don't screw this up, is um, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics dedicated to the health of children. And right on their website um, is called DC Park Prescription Rating Tool. So they're giving prescriptions as part of their public health campaign. And the idea is volunteers, like my sister-in-law's sister, are, are going to be driven by better information about parks that they have better access to, and they can include as part of these prescriptions for public health. Um, so that's something I've never heard of before. I was curious if anybody else has heard about that across the country, but it's a pretty interesting process. So. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Require um, because on the benefits analysis team lead for the urban stormwater rule that EPA is working on right now, which is hopefully going to encourage installation of green infrastructure across the country if we can get it out there. Um, but we are looking at a wide variety of benefit categories right now. And they include benefits such as uh, air quality improvement from installing green infrastructure and flood damage reduction, groundwater recharge. Where it does become a little tricky is you need to make sure your whatever regulation you're designing is satisfying the requirements of the statute. So you can't go in and say, oh, why don't we plant, you know, 2,000 acres of trees in the Rocky Mountains because we need to do something about stormwater. That won't take care of stormwater issues in New York City. So as, as long as you're taking care of what the statute is requiring you to take care of, you can then look at the side effects of whatever regulatory action is that you're taking and, and account for those benefits. So. Uh, as far as I know, maybe the lawyers will get in touch with me afterwards <laughs> and say, no, no. 